Good morning and well, good afternoon, depending where you are. Um, welcome, everyone. Delighted to and uh, to be hosting another of the Art Talks webinar series. And today, um, I'm thrilled that we have two amazing speakers, Dr. Mauricio, who is a professor of neurology, assistant professor of neurology at um, the Mayo in Jacksonville, and Dr. Nativi Nicolau, who um, many of you may have come across in previous years. He's been um, an amazing cardiologist involved in the amyloidosis world for some time and has been fairly unique in building exceptional programs, both at the Huntsman Cancer Institute for Amyloidosis in Utah, and now is in Jacksonville um, at the Mayo. And so it's very, um, it's wonderful to see more programs being developed and how important it is that we have this multidisciplinary approach to care. So I'm excited to hear today's webinar on cardiac and neurological approaches in ATTR management. Just by brief background, the Amyloidosis Research Consortium is a nonprofit focused on making a significant impact in the curability of amyloidosis and improving quality of life for patients. We work very closely with all stakeholders across the field, includes um, regulatory science, payers, pharmaceutical companies, researchers, clinicians, and patients to collaborate to accelerate drug development and improve care. There are four main areas that ARC focuses on, improving the speed and accuracy of diagnosis, and every patient knows that that journey can be challenging and it's vital that we diagnose patients sooner so they can benefit from the evolving treatments that we have. Understanding, we have two areas of research where we want to look at and understand better the genetics and biology of the disease to identify new treatments, and also accelerating the regulatory science so that we can de develop trials faster and get um, drugs reviewed and approved and accessible to patients. And lastly, which are talks will then, we have um, a portfolio of work that improves the care and quality of life for patients focused on educational and support initiatives. Today's webinar is supported by the following companies, and we're grateful for their support. And now, without further ado, I'm delighted to hand over to Dr. Nativi. Oops, this is the last slide you'll see at the end. Um, Dr. Nativi, we're welcome to. I'll stop sharing my slides and invite you to share yours. Thank you. And while he's pulling this up, I will just add that we have a Q&A box at the bottom. If you have any questions, please type them in there. We'll hold the questions till the end, but we'll have a, um, a good session at the end where questions will be answered by the speakers. And do we have the main slide? Not the speaker, you, right? Yeah, that looks good. Okay, well, thank you so much. Uh like to uh, thank uh, Isabel and the Amyloidosis Research Consortium for all the efforts over, over the years for um, good early access to therapies to patients with amyloidosis. We were talking just a few minutes, it has been a great, great journey. Uh, we have learned a lot um, in the last uh, decade and uh, the future looks even, even better. So uh, very excited to, to join again forces uh, this time with uh, Elizabeth and the Amyloidosis Research Consortium. Uh, I'm gonna review uh, some of the uh, uh, cardiac approaches for, for the management of patients uh, with amyloidosis. These are my disclosures, um, basically related to uh, funding related to uh, clinical trials in amyloidosis. And we're gonna review uh, briefly, uh, what is the role of the cardiologist? What, what, what are the, what cardiologists should achieve for, for the management of these patients? And uh, some considerations for diagnosis, uh, management, and then when should cardiologists uh, She'll, she'll talk to the neurologist. Uh, a big emphasis uh, from Elizabeth and me today is about uh, that multidisciplinary approach, that multidisciplinary uh, 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 conversations uh, among several providers 
in order to uh, improve the quality of life of all of these patients with uh, uh, TTR amyloidosis. And um, a few things that came to my mind in terms of, of what are we asking the, the cardiologists, um, and a lot of emphasis these years, a lot of education efforts when we are talking to our cardiologists is to uh, recognize uh, and treat the constellation of symptoms. Um, I'm going to expand on that uh, briefly. Uh, also, uh, cardiologists have a big role uh, making sure that uh, we avoid uh, progression of the disease and we start these patients early on disease modifying therapies to improve survival and quality of life. And also, we want to make a case that uh, there are some patients that might not get better on medications, and there are some other options that uh, should be considered for patients with amyloidosis. In terms of the constellation of symptoms, from the cardiology side, you can see on the left side of the uh, slides the cardiovascular manifestations predominantly related to heart failure in terms of shortness of breath, fatigue, uh, and uh, swelling of the lower extremities and also in the abdomen. Um, this amyloidosis also affect the conduction system and cause electrical arrhythmias, predominantly atrial fibrillation um, that requires uh, treatment and can cause symptoms like uh, shortness of breath and some like headiness, also fatigue. And then as this uh, electrical system of the heart is also affected from amyloidosis, some patients can develop some slow pulses or their heart rates gets too low or doesn't raise enough during exercise. And these patients can have a lot of fatigue uh, from that. And some of them will require uh, bradycardias. But as, we, as you all know, uh, the symptoms of amyloidosis are, are, are more than cardiac. There's musculoskeletal symptoms. Um, we can mention a few of them, carpal tunnel, spinal stenosis with back pain, rupture of the distal bicep tendon, uh, trigger fingers, and then Elizabeth is gonna span on the neurology symptoms and the autonomic dysfunction symptoms. Uh, but the idea is that cardiologists uh, don't miss that opportunity to have a patient in their practice um, and, and expand these, these uh, questions about the symptoms. A few things that we have learned over the last years is that um, the musculoskeletal symptoms, they happen five to 15 years before um, patients have the cardiac symptoms of light, of shortness of breath and fatigue. So this is a big opportunity for the cardiologists to get that earlier diagnosis uh, and don't wait to have the full amyloidosis affecting the heart. Um, and what we are recommending is that uh, cardiologists kind of expand a little bit more their uh, review systems. And uh, when they have a patient with heart failure, uh, we we are asking them to to increase uh, more into other symptoms. Um, sometimes on, on clinical practice uh, could be uh, uh, a lot, or sometimes uh, it's hard to remember all the things or all the symptoms that they should ask. We're trying to keep it simple uh, into the musculoskeletal symptoms, and uh, we're asking cardiologists if they have a patient in their clinic with heart failure. And if they have carpal tunnel or, or spinal stenosis, to screen for amyloidosis. And this is a big change from the practice. Cardiologists before were only screening for amyloidosis is the echocardiogram was really, really, really infiltrative. But these days, we're not doing that. The practice have changed. Right now, we're not waiting for that echocardiogram or that MRI to be full infiltrative. As soon as the patient has symptoms, we are advocating, and this is what has changed the practice. This is why we're getting more and more patients with, with uh, diagnosis of amyloidosis on mask. If you think about it, and something that we tell our cardiologists is that all of them have patients with amyloidosis. 
every single cardiologist in the world have a patient with amyloidosis. We know that. We have done studies around the world. It doesn't matter where you are. You can be in the United States. You can be in Central America. You can be in Europe. You can be in Japan. It doesn't matter where you are. If you have patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, and they are more than 65 years old, around 10 to 14% of them have unrecognized amyloidosis. So this is data that is coming from all the countries. So this is a big opportunity for patients, uh, for cardiologists to make sure that just with the symptoms, we can start thinking about amyloidosis and we don't have to wait for that echocardiogram to become infiltrative. And then um, Elizabeth is gonna span a little bit more on the neurological symptoms. Um, it's important, I'm gonna, talk about medications a little bit later on the conference, uh, but it's important that cardiologists uh, prescribe medications that are known to improve survival and quality of life on patients with amyloidosis, and we will talk more about it. And also, this is from the recent uh, uh, American College of Cardiology consensus on ATTR amyloidosis, is that cardiologists should also recognize that some patients, medications are not enough. And we are advocating to stage these patients either with biomarkers, some of you get anti-pro-BMP measures uh, when you go and see your cardiologist, this is a way to screen for patients. But the reality is that there are some patients that are diagnosed um, several years after the disease process and there are other options um, I would say predominantly heart transplantation is something that we, all of our patients that comes to our practice here in Florida, they are screened, uh, we put them on medications, but at the same time, they're being screened for heart transplantation because uh, the traditional practice is to refer, to think about heart transplantation if your heart is weak. So that's the most common reason to have a referral for heart transplant. The patients with amyloidosis, their hearts are still strong if we measure the ejection fraction. If you remember when you go to your cardiologist and your doctor mentioned the ejection fraction, in the majority of the patients is above 50%. But it doesn't matter. You can have an ejection fraction of 50%, 55%, 60%, and your heart might be very, very affected from amyloidosis. These are patients that can still benefit from a heart transplantation. Um, so this is something that the cardiology side and the American College of Cardiology is educating and emphasizing that, yes, it's important to start disease-modifying medications, but also we have other options uh, of treatment, including heart transplantation. And we are very active on that uh, screening here in our program. Um, moving to uh, uh, considerations during the diagnosis, the, the statement from the American College of Cardiology is very clear in terms of what the cardiologist should do. Uh, they should screen for light change amyloidosis. That is not the topic of this conference, but it's very important to rule it out because this disease advances faster than TTR amyloidosis. And the guidelines are very clear. They if the, if the monoclonal screening is abnormal, the next step is to consult with hematology. So we're not asking cardiologists to make a diagnosis of light change amyloidosis. We're asking cardiologists to screen for that. And then if the testing is abnormal, then get the help of this multidisciplinary approach. So cardiologists need to span the referring providers, right? Cardiologists, we are very good referring to echocardiography, to pacemakers, to open heart surgery for bypass. In the field of amyloidosis, cardiologists need to span that alliance of, of providers and they need to include a hematologist, uh, they need to include neurologists and many other uh, providers in order to provide an early access, an early diagnosis and early access to therapies. So Education that we give cardiologists is about how to interpret this monoclonal testing. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this today, but uh, a lot of them tell me, Dr. TV, I have never ordered a light change protein in my life. And it's, we say it's okay. You just have to order it. 
and then uh, we can help with the interpretation. And then on the pyrophosphate scan that a lot of you has been diagnosed with pyrophosphate scan, uh, we have been learning, you know, this was uh, kind of uh, um, validated for uh, TTR amyloidosis diagnosis in 2016. And there has been a learning curve on the interpretation of this uh, scan that it basically we inject a tracer that is a bone tracer. And um, as you can see on the planar images here, um, you can see the ribs here and uh, you can see the heart here, how it lights up. Uh, suggesting amyloid deposition, but the most important educational part for cardiologists is that make sure that they include uh, on top of the planar images that are the ones that we have here, that we include spec images because the planar images doesn't tell you if the optic that we're seeing is on the heart or the blood. As you can see here at the top, there's an example where this tracer on the spec, we can see it here in yellow, is on the muscle of the heart, but in the bottom uh, part, even though it was a positive planar images on a spec, we can see here that the yellow is not on the muscle. That yellow, that tracer is going through the blood and this could be read as a positive study, but it's not a positive study. So um, a lot to uh, education and uh, it has been a learning curve, but we're getting much, much better and uh, I will say that the majority of the centers in the United States are including spec images uh, to the imaging. In terms of the management and what is the role of the cardiologist, uh, we can start with um, um, the medications that are disease modifying, meaning that they uh, treat the amyloidosis. Uh, the ones that have an asterisk are under research or uh, they, are, they have off-label use, um, starting with tafamidis. Tafamidis is FDA approved uh, after the ATTR trial shows significant improvement on survival and reduce uh, uh, cardiovascular hospitalizations. Uh, so it's a drug that we know that it works, is very uh, safe. Um, uh, so this is what we have available. Uh, acoramides, uh, the studies are coming out and being completed about it. I uh, hope to uh, see the final results of these studies. Diflunisol has, uh, is, has been studies on hereditary TTR with polyneuropathy, has not been studied on cardiomyopathy, uh, and is an alternative to tafamides on patients that either have cannot afford the families or they live in a country that don't have the families available. And then there are other mechanisms uh, of medications that the, 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 the stabilizers basically bind to this TTR protein here that you see in the middle and avoid the transformation into the amyloidosis fibril. But you all all aware of uh, newer medications that work directly on the liver where is the production of this protein? And we have the silencers that work on the messenger RNA, um, patisaran and butrisaran that are approved for hereditary with polyneuropathy TTR. And they are undergoing evaluation for wild type cardiomyopathy too, waiting for these studies to be completed, same as m -plotersin. And then very novel, we have now TTR gene editors for patients with hereditary amyloidosis where these medications work directly on the DNA, meaning that one dose of the medication can fix uh, the mutation and uh, it fix the problem with just one dose. So very exciting. All of these uh, things are gonna come, are undergoing investigation. And what is really exciting for, for me personally is the next chapter on, on medical therapy. That is something that all of you, our patients ask, Dr. Nativi, what, okay that you're stabilizing the protein, but what are you gonna do with my heart that is already full of amyloidosis? We don't have anything at this point, but research are coming, the preliminary data is very encouraging. And these are studies that we are opening right now on several centers in the United States and Europe, and they are gonna be available for you to join these clinical trials of, um, monoclonal antibodies that the attempt is will be to see if we can remove those fibrils that are on your tissue. So 
very exciting. Uh, in terms of the management of your symptoms uh, for heart failure, uh, we prefer uh, loop diuretic like bumetanide or torsemide. Some of them are on Lasix and furosemide. If that's working well for you, you can keep it. But we have found that um, furosemide uh, have difficulties being absorbed in patients with amyloidosis. So we have seen a better response on bumetanide or torsemide. We also include spironolactone uh, for management of, pot of, potassium, of potassium. For atrial fibrillation, anticoagulation is very important. A lot of you are probably in some type of anticoagulation, either warfarin, apixaban, ribaroxaban. Amiodarone, I would say, is one of the most common medications prescribed for atrial fibrillation. Some people can be treated when their pulses are very fast. We can use uh, digoxin or low dose beta blockers. Beta blockers, we have to be careful because can worsen the fatigue. We need to be careful that none of you are on diltiazem and on verapamil. And if any of you are taking diltiazem and on verapamil, talk to your cardiologist immediately because that's a problem. That can cause um, uh, it binds to the amyloidosis fibril on the heart and it can become toxic, the medication, and you can have cardiac arrest from this. Uh, this is something that we have seen and several amyloidosis pro actors have seen in their practice. So make sure that none of you are in any of these two medications. Patients with atrial fibrillation, we can treat them also with cardioversions or ablations as needed. For the electrical conduction issues, uh, some of them will require pace pacemakers. And orthostatic hypotension is something that I routinely check in our practice. Um, it's more common than I thought. The more that I look for it, the more that I find it, even on patients with life change, uh, I mean, even in patients with wild type amyloidosis. Um, if they have orthostatic hypotension, I start midodrine. And if then if midodrine doesn't work, I go to periodic stigming. And then if that doesn't work, then I call Elizabeth to help me. Uh, with other medications uh, that she has access for uh, autonomic dysfunction and orthostatic hypotension. Um, the last part is about when should we call an a neurologist? Well, the way that I see it in a multidisciplinary practice, when you are working on a, on a place, uh, I'm, I have been fortunate to work on two uh, big um, amyloidosis practice, multidisciplinary, and what I have learned from both of them is that you need to work on your alliances. We need to work on providers that can help us with the diagnosis, a group of providers that can help us to make confirm the diagnosis, and also providers that can help us on the follow-up. And the neurologist from the cardiovascular perspective from my side can help us in all of those areas. Um, the neurologist can help us identify patients in their clinic if they go with neuropathy, and by the way, they have heart failure. Well, that's a patient that should be screened for cardiac amyloidosis. The neurologist help us with the electro uh, uh, myographies and all of those nerve studies and autonomic dysfunction studies to confirm that the patient has amyloidosis polyneuropathy. Um, and then on follow-up, very important, these patients can have severe autonomic dysfunction, severe neuropathy, and the collaboration, that alliance with neurologists on all of these areas of care is very important. So um, this is from the American College of Cardiology's consensus statement. Um, even though is by the American College of Cardiology, is multidisciplinary and it has a lot of graph tables, diagrams of all the other organs, the GI system, the nephrology system, and also neurology system. So this document is something that we share with our cardiology providers, and it gives an idea of the impact of including a neurologist in your practice, evaluating. Uh, all the things that uh, uh, Liz is going to talk to us in a few minutes. So uh, with this, I cover uh, what I was asked to uh, cover today. There's plenty more. I hope that we have uh, an opportunity for, for questions. This is our uh, centers, uh, Mayo Clinic centers uh, available for you in Arizona, Minnesota. And this is our center here in Florida. And uh, now I'm going to stop sharing. And I'm going to introduce, uh, pause share, stop share, um, Dr. Elizabeth Mauricio. Uh, she uh, trained here at Mayo uh, Jacksonville on, on neurology. And um, 
she she was hired and she has uh, grow very fast and she is vice chair of uh, practice on the department of neurology she's a program director of the neurology residency program um, and she has dedicated her professional career to the field of amyloidosis um, participating on uh, several uh, clinical trials for this patient. And she's a, a strong member of our multidisciplinary practice here in Jacksonville, uh, Florida. So uh, with you, uh, we have uh, Dr. Elizabeth Mauricio. Thank you. Thank you for the warm introduction, Dr. Nativi. And thanks to everyone for having me today. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak on the topic. All right, so where does the neurologist fit in? And I think you teed me up pretty well, Dr. Nativi. We work together as a team. What I'm gonna go through um, is a few different things. One is how we, uh, again, focus on disease recognition and getting to the right diagnosis in a timely fashion. Um, and you know, patients might come to the neurologist directly. We might be the first point of care in the medicine world for these patients. So it, oftentimes it's up to us to recognize the constellation of symptoms that Dr. Nativi mentioned so that we can have it on our radar. Because if we don't, we are going to miss this diagnosis. Um, so that's something that we're passionate about is making sure we're educating others and recognizing this disease early. Um, or maybe we're not the first uh, person in their their long line of doctors. Maybe these patients come to us from neurology, from cardiology or hematology. And it's, at that point, we, it's our job to make sure if they already have the diagnosis to see if they have any evident neurologic manifestations of the disease, whether that's peripheral neuropathy, autonomic dysfunction, carpal tunnel syndrome, very common. Um, and then based upon that initiating treatment and management of disease as appropriate. So that's the neurologist role. So as you all know, this disease affects many organ organs uh, throughout the body, many organs, not just the nerves, not just the heart, it has the potential to impact many of the body systems. And unfortunately, a lot of people out there, a lot of uh, lay people, a lot of people in medicine even, don't know a lot about this disease. Um, so that's why education is so important. And that means that oftentimes patients may go many months, sometimes years before getting to an accurate diagnosis. And now given the our, our ability to treat and halt progression of disease, it is so important to recognize the disease early so that we can focus on uh, reducing the burden of disease and improving quality of life for our patients. So how do we go about investigating for neurologic manifestations of amyloidosis? So first, the neurologic exam is an important part of that. So we are going to look at motor function, your strength. We're going to test your reflexes. We're going to do detailed sensory exam to see if we see any uh, signs of, of disease. Um, an extension of our neurologic exam is uh, oftentimes we use EMG or electromyography, kind of pictured here. Um, and this is a test, it's a nerve and muscle test that can help us to differentiate or uh, uh, discover peripheral neuropathy if that's something that we're thinking about clinically. And to differentiate neuropathy from other things that might mimic neuropathy. Um, so this is an important part of the workup. So a nerve and muscle test or EMG uh, oftentimes gets a bad rap. Some people come into the EMG lab and they're so afraid to have this test done. But in the right hands, uh, most patients do totally fine with this test. There's two parts. There's a nerve conduction part of it where we use a little electrode and we stimulate the nerves, and then we're measuring how high amplitude responses we're getting, how fast those nerves are conducting. And we have normal values to compare that to. Um, also with the EMG, we're able to uh, identify carpal tunnel syndrome, which is very common. And I think there was a question in the chat, well, why don't our orthopedic 
uh, doctors uh, check every patient with carpal tunnel syndrome for amyloidosis? And that's a good question. And that actually has been done in some centers um, where they're looking at when they do carpal tunnel release surgeries, they're staining those uh, that tissue that they're taking out for amyloid. And that is an effective way to discover it and, and maybe uh, recognize the disease sooner. Um, that being said, Carpal tunnel syndrome is so common and it's not unique to amyloidosis. So we have patients who might um, have carpal tunnel syndrome related to rheumatoid arthritis or diabetes, or it happens when they're pregnant. Um, so there's a lot of other causes. So it's not necessarily specific for amyloidosis, but certainly if someone has neuropathy and carpal tunnel syndrome and uh, cardiac disease, I'm always thinking about this disease and that's important. And then autonomic neuropathy is not something that we can detect on an EMG, but we have other means by which we can further assess the autonomic nervous system. Um, one is, and these tests, the autonomic reflex tests are not done at all centers. Um, so we're lucky we have a really great autonomics laboratory here at Mayo Clinic in Florida that we can further investigate these symptoms. So um, an autonomic reflex test is not painful or invasive, but we're looking at things uh, like your heart rate and blood pressure to different positions in space. Does your heart, does your uh, blood pressure drop when you're upright compared to when you're laying down? So that helps us to detect orthostatic hypotension and delineate that, that further better than we can at the bedside. Um, we're also looking at sweat production. So we uh, use these little, they're called iontophores. They're little stickers we put on the skin in a couple different areas in the limbs. And we're able to chemically induce sweat production. And believe it or not, there are normal values for how long it takes for your body to produce sweat and how much sweat is produced. And that's a pretty sensitive measure of uh, small fiber function. So uh, if someone has got neuropathy that's just affecting the small sensory fibers, uh, EMG might be normal, but we might be able to pick that up on an autonomic reflex test. So all those uh, EMG autonomic reflex tests, sometimes you might also do skin biopsy. Skin Skin biopsy can tell us a lot of things. It can tell us what the density of those small nerve fibers are in the skin. That's another way we can diagnose small fiber neuropathy. But then also we can look at the tissue under a microscope and stain for amyloid fibers and detect amyloidosis that way. So those are all the tools that we have in our pocket to, as an extension of our neurologic exam to help uh, make diagnoses and also to, to see what in what way the body is affected by this disease. Dr. Nativi mentioned all the exciting things that we have now to treat amyloidosis. Um, and this list is growing and, you know, it was very exciting five years ago when we had some, these silencers hit the market and were able to halt progression of disease. Um, but now even like Dr. Nativi mentioned, being able to not only halt progression, but to have an effect on those amyloid deposits that are already impairing tissue function, um, that's going to be a game changer. And we're really excited about that. So, uh, and all to say that disease diagnosis early is, is so important so that we can start treatment as soon as possible. Now, I'm going to just touch briefly on how we manage some of the neurologic manifestations of amyloidosis. So neuropathy is fairly common in this disease, not so much in wild-type TTR, but in hereditary amyloidosis, um, a lot of patients do suffer from neuropathy. Now, um, neuropathy can mean many things. It can mean loss of sensation, uh, it can affect our balance, it can cause people to have falls related to impaired balance, it can cause weakness. So my patients might have foot drop, they might have reduced grip strength. It might be so weak that they're in a wheelchair and they're unable to walk. So there's a wide spectrum of severity and, um, and it, uh, neuropathy in two patients with amyloidosis might look very differently in, the, in those two patients, even if they have the same mutation in hereditary amyloidosis. Um, pain is not an uncommon feature of neuropathy. 
And neuropathic pain can be difficult to treat. Um, and so uh, it's, I think it's important to understand how we treat it and what are the limitations of a treatment that's currently available. Treatment for neuropathic pain is not going to affect that loss of sensation. We don't have any fix for that. So you're always going to have that numbness. But when we say we're going to give you a medication for neuropathy or neuropathic pain, it's really helping with that tingling, electric shock sensation, burning, that pain associated with the, the nerve damage. The most common things that we use uh, in terms of medications, and you probably have heard of gabapentin or Neurontin as the trade name for that. That's kind of our drug of choice because we it's been a long uh, been around for a while. Most people tolerate it well, and there's a wide range of dosing that we can use. Um, and what dose uh, is needed for each patient really varies. Um, but there are other medications as well. But that's usually our, our first drug of choice um, if the patient hasn't tried that yet. So aside from treating neuropathic pain, which can be a, a bit challenging at times, um, we want to make sure that we're doing everything uh, to reduce falls because falling uh, can falls can be devastating. A fractured hip is going to be a game changer in this disease for anyone, actually. Um, so we want to make sure that we're optimizing um, uh, injury prevention and fall prevention. And this might mean, say, someone has weakness related to neuropathy and they have a foot drop. So they're dragging their feet and it, they're more prone to trip over their feet. So maybe they need uh, an orthotic would be helpful to keep that foot in a neutral position when they walk so they're not more prone to trip over it. Uh, maybe uh, someone needs a, a walker or a cane or a walking stick, kind of a third leg of support to reduce their fall risk. Maybe it's time to look, um, look around at the surroundings at home and are there throw rugs or um, are you having to walk through a dark hallway to get to the bathroom at night? Um, so those are things that we can we can modify and, and make sure we're doing everything that we can to reduce your risk of fall. And, and that happens, the impaired balance is because we rely on feedback from the nerves in our feet to tell our brain where everything is in space. So it's that loss of sensory input to the brain, but also weakness, again, if, if we're uh, physically not able to uh, lift our feet properly, then obviously all those things can um, can increase your risk of falling. Another important thing when we're talking about neuropathy is taking good care of our feet because of that reduced sensation. We might not notice that we have a splinter or um, that we've got a blister on our foot from wearing those tennis sneakers at the mall. So um, we want to make sure we're inspecting our feet closely every day and regularly and, and going to a podiatrist regularly um, and making sure that our, our feet are in, in good shape so that we're not increasing our risk of infection. And then physical therapy is important too, trying to... Um, uh, strengthen the muscles that we have in good working order, uh, working on balance, uh, and also assessing for needs of gait, uh, gait assistive devices, whether it be a, a walking stick or a cane or a walker. Um, so physical therapists are uh, definitely on speed dial in, in our office when we're, we're talking to patients who have amyloidosis. And then... Um, just touching on autonomic dysfunction. And I use this emoji here because these symptoms can be real, um, really tough and, and really negatively impact quality of life for our patients. And these are patients too that uh, oftentimes patients might not offer up if they're not asked directly. Um, so it's important that we as uh, providers we, that we do ask about these symptoms because a lot of them can be mediated, uh, whether it's by um, medications or other lifestyle changes that we can help. So orthostatic hypotension is, is one thing that's very common in this disease. And that's if you uh, say stand, go from uh, sit, seated or lying down to standing fast, oftentimes patients might get lightheaded and might actually even pass out. Um, so it's, and that's due to um, 
that drop in blood pressure. Um, so there are things that we can do to help mediate that. And Dr. Nativi had mentioned some medications that we can use like um, Midodrin or, or protostigmine. Um, but there are a lot of things too um, that you could do as a patient that you can do without medications that might help with this uh, orthostatic hypotension. Now, oftentimes patients who don't have cardiomyopathy, we talk about importance of staying well hydrated and fluids and make sure, and sometimes you might, might actually add salt to the diet, but it, it becomes, uh, that becomes a tightrope, uh, so to speak, when we're dealing with patients who also have uh, trouble managing their fluids related to cardiomyopathy. So we're not just pushing fluids in, in uh, patients with orthostatic hypertension in this disease. We have to be careful about that. But making sure that we are optimizing our body's health in terms of uh, particularly lower limb or leg strength. So working out those quadricep muscles can help to uh, restore blood flow to the heart, to keep uh, blood where it needs to be so it's not pulled in the legs. So lower limb strengthening exercises are important. There's physical maneuvers that someone can do, say if they have to stand for a prolonged period of time, um, marching in place or rising up on their calf muscles. Again, trying to use those muscles to pump blood back to the heart. Um, other things that um, we want to avoid, we want to avoid prolonged bed rest because then our body gets used to lying down and then standing up becomes even more difficult. And sometimes we might actually have patients put some cinder blocks under the foot under the head of their bed to raise the head of the bed about 20 degrees and that can help the body uh, manage uh, orthostatic hypotension better. So those are just some things also compression stockings and abdominal binders those things can all help. Um, but that's not the only in sign of autonomic dysfunction, there's a long list. So it can affect our bowel motility, it can affect our bladder function, um, and can cause other problems like reduced sweat production and dry eyes and dry, dry mouth. So there are a lot of things that we can help to mitigate these symptoms. And um, it's important that you tell your doctor about them so that we can make sure that we're doing everything we can to help improve your quality of life and manage these symptoms. And then lastly, I'll talk about carpal tunnel syndrome. Again, very common problem, uh, even outside of amyloidosis, uh, but particularly in this disease, both wild type and hereditary amyloidosis, patients manifest with carpal tunnel syndrome. And for reasons we don't really know, those amyloid uh, uh, fibrils really love that space. They love to deposit in that space. And it's a small space. There's a lot of things running through it, aside from the median nerve, which gets crunched, but there's tendons and blood vessels. And um, and when you use your hands a lot during the day, um, that's when people can have numbness and pain and even weakness and grip strength. So how do we manage that? So the first step conservatively is we recommend our patients to wear wrist splints at night. And the point of the wrist splint is to help to keep the wrist in a neutral position because oftentimes at night we tend to curl our wrists up like this when we sleep that makes that space even smaller so when we keep the wrist in the neutral position like this it allows that nerve some more room to breathe so it's better able to tolerate all the things that we do with our hands during the day if that is not effective or certainly if it's severe and there's hand weakness we want to act early and um, do a carpal tunnel release so we uh, phone a friend, uh, call our orthopedic hand specialist. And, and it's a relatively simple procedure. They go in, they just open up that space a bit um, and gives that, that nerve more room uh, to breathe and not be crunched by all those amyloid deposits. So that's the typical management of carpal tunnel syndrome in this disease. And then lastly, when do we call a cardiologist? All the time, Dr. Nativi and I are... are, are uh, relying on each other for help and not and not just us either. We're, we're very lucky here to have a, a big multidisciplinary amyloid clinic where we can um, share patients and, and make sure that we are addressing in a holistic way that uh, 360 view of each patient and every organ system, make sure that we're optimizing things uh, holistically. Um, so it's, it's very common either, you know, uh, 
and it goes both ways. We rely on each other and, and I might be the first point of contact or cardiology might or hematology, um, but we all work together uh, quite frequently in this disease. Um, and, and, and it's interesting because the, the FDA approval of medications kind of tailors the way to, you know, the patterns of referral. So now say a patient has primarily cardiomyopathy related to disease, but these silencers are not yet FDA approved for that, right? You know, I'm, I'm sure at some point they will be. Um, but now their cardiologists are really making sure we're not missing any hint of neuropathy that might qualify them and get insurance approval for uh, patisseron or rutriceron or something like that. So um, we make sure that we're working together so that we can get the latest and greatest treatment for our patients that's going to help them. Um, and then my last slide here, just a, a plug for all the um the great members of our multidisciplinary Emily Clinic in Mayo, Florida. Um, it's a great team, and we're lucky to be able to work together and, and help our patients together. And that is my last slide, so I'm going to stop sharing here. Excellent. Thank you so much. This was um, a wonderful talk, and I could definitely fill the next 15 minutes with my questions. I would restrain from doing that. Um, although I will, I will step up because I think it would be helpful, um, and I see we have had a, a couple of questions that touch on this, is we often think about hereditary ATTR having neurological manifestations and wild type being a cardiac type. Can you talk to the fact, and we certainly hear from a lot of patients with wild type who seem to have neurological issues as well. Um, can you talk to that a bit? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think that it, with wall type, the most common reason that I'm seeing them in the neurology clinic is because of carpal tunnel syndrome. Now, it's tough because peripheral neuropathy, classically, we don't associate with wall type amyloidosis, although sometimes we see patients that have neuropathy and they have wall type and we don't find any other uh, explainable cause for the neuropathy. So it makes us wonder, and there's some case reports out there too, where we biopsy a nerve and it, sure enough, it shows amyloid. So I'm not saying it's never the case, but usually it's carpal tunnel that we're, as a neurologist, I'm seeing those wild type patients. Um, and that, like Dr. Nativi mentioned, they might have come, they may have had carpal tunnel release 20 years ago before they ever had any hint of, of heart disease. So it's interesting how that predates the cardiomyopathy sides of things. Um, so yes, and and I guess the thing is about neuropathy, it's fairly common. <laughs> it's not unique to amyloid. Um, diabetes is the most common cause of neuropathy, but probably 10, 15, 20% of the patients, at least that we see here at Mayo Clinic who come in for neuropathy, uh, about a good chunk of those patients, we don't find a cause and we call it idiopathic. And so that's when it gets complicated when we're seeing someone with idiopathic neuropathy and wall type amyloid, are they related or not? I think we still have more work to do uh, on that front. And, and just to follow on to that is there was a question that asked that what, um, how do you tell the difference between diabetic neuropathy and amyloid related neuropathy? That's a great question. They can look exactly the same. A diabetic neuropathy can also come with autonomic symptoms, so they can look very, very similar. And there's no distinguishing features on EMG studies either. So that's why we need to think about amyloid. Otherwise, we're going to miss it. Um, so certainly, if, if we have a patient with neuropathy that doesn't have diabetes, um, we are still on the hunt for a treatable cause. Um, and um, But again, it has to be on a differential diagnosis. Otherwise, we surely are going to miss it. So, Lauren, another question, and it's um, around combination therapies. And, um, and you touched on this around... Um, you know, some of these novel therapies we've seen, which we know have very high prices associated with them, have been approved for ATTR, PM, polyneuropathy, and others for cardiac. Um, how do you approach that? It's something, um, how, yes, how do you approach combination therapies? Is this done together? Do you look at it as isolating the symptoms? How is that managed at, at Mayor Jacksonville? Well, um... I don't think 
there's a specific guide guidance uh, about uh, combination therapy. Um, every center is approaching it in in a different way because we are still learning about the impact of the of the silencers on on cardiomyopathy. Um, there are some some centers that are that are able to combine a, a silencer with a stabilizer. I think it's just a few few patients that are on on this combination. Um, uh, cost will be probably the the major uh, barrier, um, but but we don't have we don't have data to 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 support it. The people that are doing combination therapy is uh, providers that are seeing progression on a single on a single therapy, and the the patient is pro advancing uh, very fast. Definitely, <clears throat> that would be an argument for combination therapy. I think the future definitely is going to be combination therapy, uh, if especially if we if we can if if the future shows that we can have medications to remove the fibrils, definitely I will say that um, we will have better uh, approvals for either a stabilizer or a silencer, uh, and then adding the 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 removal of the of the deposit of the fibril. Definitely that's something that I'm looking forward as a combination therapy. But what we have now for combination therapy, few cases, few patients that are progressing pretty fast. And so maybe a good time to touch on um, the role of clinical trials. And I know there've been a, a couple of questions which are around how do you participate in clinical trials? Um, do you want to talk about that a little bit? don't know if Liz want to start or? So a good resource for all patients is the clinicaltrials.gov website. And you could tap, type in amyloid or a specific type of amyloid, and you could see all the clinical trials out there going on in that disease. So that's a good resource that I share with all my patients. Um, and I think it's it's actually tough to keep up with because there are so many trials going on, and, and uh, which is good. There are so many more uh, you know, options for patients. So I think talk to your providers, um, and they could probably give you insight into what's going on at their institution and elsewhere. Um, but it's an ever changing uh, landscape, and. Um, there are no positive clinical trials right now. I see uh, certainly uh, advancing the field in the right direction. I, I agree with uh, Dr. Mauricio. I think uh, it's evolving. Like for example, what we have here in our center last year is not the same of what we have available this year. And it's not the same that we're gonna have available for next year in terms of clinical trials. So it's evolving very fast. Um, I think that sessions like these, uh, the support from the amyloidosis research consortium is a, is a way to um, advertise uh, opportunities for, for clinical trials. Um, uh, and, uh, and, you know, trying to figure out what is, what is available, what is open. I have sometimes a dedicated session just to explain to the patient, okay, these are the three options that we have and trying to talk to the patient, probably this one will be a better fit for you because some of them have placebo or it doesn't have placebo or that have uh, traveling things. So uh, sometimes you need to have that conversation just dedicated about what is the best clinical trial for each patient. And I will give a small plug here for our, we do have a tool called My Amyloidosis Pathfinder. You can find it one word, myamyloidosispathfinder.org. And you um, sign up for it, you enter your disease type and answer a few questions, and that then will automatically alert you to any clinical trials that you may match. Um, and definitely connecting with your physicians and certainly amyloid centers are very informed about clinical trials to open. And there are, as Dr. Mitty said, many trials and involving the, um, the research landscape, which is really exciting. And wherever possible, if you can participate in a clinical trial, that's a, an important thing to do. Um, there's an interesting question from somebody who has two brothers who've been diagnosed with wild type ATTR. 
and he was questioning whether that um, are there genes that just haven't been discovered? Could it be a hereditary type? Not that we are aware. I don't know. There was we just have a session about these. Uh, maybe it's the same the same brothers. Uh, they uh, here at um, Mayo, Arizona, actually. They have these two brothers with wild type, very physical, very, uh, and and we went through the whole genetic uh, screening, much, much deeper than the one that we get for clinical part. And, and we were not able to find um, a, a gene connection. That doesn't mean that there's not one that we haven't been able to measure, but we were not able to find uh, a, a gene. However, both brothers were very physically active and both were kind of a competitive sports that that might be a hint of, uh, because it's something that we're seeing that, um, that uh, patients that are uh, physically active, that they have a history of being uh, hikers or marathoners is something that uh, it's not nothing concrete right now, but I would say that a significant number of our patients, uh, when they were younger, they were very uh, physically active. So the, the answer is no, we have not find a, a connection when there's two brothers having wild type um, uh, yet, but uh, maybe it's a gene that we haven't ident characterized yet, or maybe it's the environment or their uh, physical activity that could be uh, a, a common uh, issue. And still much to learn about these. Yeah. Um, here's a, a question around um, a patient who has the Irish variant and a hereditary ATTR. And in nerve conduction tests, EMG shows that I do not have peripheral neuropathy, but I'm told that I do have polyneuropathy. What's the distinction being made? Um, good question. So that's a tough one. I mean, polyneuropathy and peripheral neuropathy go hand in hand and essentially mean the same thing. Um, but there is one thing that might apply here. I mean, uh, if, if someone has an isolated small fiber neuropathy, meaning just the small nerve fibers are involved, those are the sensory fibers that conduct information to the brain related to pain and temperature, someone has purely a small fiber neuropathy, those nerves are too small to pick up on an EMG. So the EMG can be completely normal, but we might be able to pick up a small fiber neuropathy on a skin biopsy or on an autonomic reflex testing. So maybe that's the, the caveat there. But typically when someone says polyneuropathy or peripheral neuropathy, we're talking about the same thing. And the classic presentation of neuropathy that's oftentimes in, in this disease usually holds true as well, but that it's a length dependent process. So it's the tips of those longest nerves that are affected first, meaning that patients often manifest first with symptoms in their toes and their feet, and that might slowly progress up the foot and even into the leg. Usually by the time it reaches the knees, then it might uh, experience symptoms in the fingertips. So it's typically a length dependent process. We're talking about the nerve health. But yeah, maybe it's a small fiber neuropathy and the EMG was normal. Um, that's what I'm guessing. And we have a number of questions around, um, you know, degrading, uh, around degraders, if there's anything now that people are on either the stabilizers or silencers, but not necessarily feeling any better or seeing a benefit from it. Um, so what is there, are there any treatment options or is it, this is what we hope for in the future? Well, I try to explain the patients that the medications that we have FDA approved now, they are not designed to make them feel better. So a lot of patients come back to me and say, Dr. Nativi, I have been two, three months on this medication and I am uh, about the same. And, and that's actually a good thing that he's not, the patient is not getting worse, right? Because that's what the mechanism of the medication trying to do is to slow the progression and avoid that, uh, that, that progression of symptoms. So that's a good thing. But 
Uh, sometimes the impression is that, okay, I'm going to be on this medication and I'm going to feel better. No, these medications doesn't work that way. Uh, the future is encouraging. Uh, the future, the hope is that, yes, we're going to have medication that they're going to allow some recovery. The idea is that removing these fibrils is going to allow some recovery on, on cardiac function and in other organ functions. So if there's progression of the disease on the curing medications, uh, what we try to do is to move them from one class to another class. Uh, we talk about some people are doing combination therapy. I think the most common thing that is happening is that uh, is the patient uh, can meet criteria for a silencer. We move them from a stabilizer to a silencer. And what we try to do is also to put them on clinical trials of, of, of other other mechanism, um, like if the patient is on a stabilizer, try to put them on a clinical study for a silencer or to put them on a clinical trial for a degrader. Okay. Speaks back to your comment earlier about really understanding studies and that there isn't the risk of necessary placebo that you could be on an active drug where um, when you're trying something in combination. I do know we're at time and I know there were a couple of questions and um, around raising awareness for earlier diagnosis, particularly when we look at other um, areas and specialties like orthopedics and how might we do that as a community? Um, from, from my side, I think, uh, I think that yes, there's more education needed. Uh, it has to be strategic. We have learned that over the years. Um, for example, going to orthopedics meetings and telling them that, yeah, you need to screen for amyloidosis, that's not going to work. Uh, it has to be a collaboration between an amyloidosis expert uh, champion and the orthopedist doctor. It's not going to happen by itself. Like you go and you tell the orthopedics, go and screen for amyloidosis every time you do a carpal tunnel release. It's not going to work. It has been tried. It has to be a collaboration. The successful groups that has done this collaboration with orthopedics is because they are able to get it together. Kind of uh, the, the champion, the amyloidosis champion talks to the orthopedics and let them know these are the patients that should be screened. Um, so I think uh, that that's one way to approach orthopedics. Uh, cardiology, I'm telling you, there's a lot of work to do. There's still a lot of education. I don't think we're done with cardiology. I am biased that uh, these patients are already on the cardiology clinic. I am biased that these patients, you don't have to go and look for them at home. These patients are already on the cardiology practice clinic, a lot of them. And this is a big opportunity. So I am, I'm doing a big emphasis because I feel like I'm not done with cardiology. You can see the big uh, consensus from the American College of Cardiology. And, uh, but there's, those are some examples. There are multiple ways to educate for earlier diagnosis with orthopedics, general cardiologists, internal medicine. Uh, I don't know if Elizabeth have something else about early diagnosis. Yeah, it's a huge task and it's not like a one and done. It it needs, you know, repetition, repetition, repetition. So any opportunity that I have, if I'm speaking at a primary care conference, I'll, I'll my interrupt the example is amyloid. So I hone it in and make sure that they know about this disease or at least they've heard about it. So maybe next time they'll think about it. But it is, uh, it is part of our mission here at Mayo Clinic is to be on the forefront of educating other providers so that we can do just that. But uh, we need help. And I think uh, partnering with the ARC is uh, a wonderful avenue to get the word out as well. Um, and patients are our best advocates as well. So I know our patients do a lot for this disease. And, and, um, and so hopefully uh, with time, uh, maybe we need some commercials. I don't know. I see a lot of drug commercials out there, but maybe we need more amyloid commercials. Excellent. Thank you. And you both are remarkable champions and um, it's wonderful to hear how you're raising awareness both internally and practices and beyond that. Um, and thank you so much. This was an excellent talk today. Um, lots of food for thought and wonderful advice um, for patients. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh,